Welcome to the Your Vote 2018 Congressional District 2 debate, presented live from the Tucson Jewish Community Center by Arizona Public Media, KJZZ, the Arizona Daily Star, and the Arizona Republic. Tonight's moderator is Christopher Conover. Good evening and welcome to tonight's debate. I'm the political reporter here at Arizona Public Media, and there is nothing like election season. Tonight, we'll spend an hour discussing the concerns of the people of the 2nd Congressional District in Arizona, with the two women vying to represent that district in the U.S. House. So let's get right to it. Please give a warm Tucson welcome to the 2018 candidates for Arizona's 2nd Congressional District, Democrat Ann Kirkpatrick and Republican Leah Marquez Peterson. Thank you, ladies, for both of you joining us here tonight. Also here on the stage are the host and co-producer of Arizona 360, Lorraine Rivera, and from our debate partners, Steve Goldstein of our sister station in Phoenix, KJZZ, Joe Ferguson of the Arizona Daily Star, and Ron Hansen of the Arizona Republic. Now, before we begin, here are the rules for tonight's discussion. Each candidate will get a 90-second opening statement and a one-minute closing statement. In between, our panel of journalists will ask questions from a list they've prepared and the candidates haven't seen yet. The questions will be directed to one candidate who will have one minute to respond. Then the other candidate will have 30 seconds to rebut. If one of our journalists has a follow-up question, both candidates will have 45 seconds to respond. We'll alternate who gets each question and we'll strictly enforce the time limits. Now, if a candidate repeatedly exceeds her allotted time, we may give extra time to the other candidate in an effort to balance the opportunity for the audience to hear from both candidates. Lastly, a note to our live audience. We're broadcasting this live on TV, radio, and the internet. Any interruptions take away time from the candidates. who That's who we all came to see. Disruptive behavior will not be tolerated and may result in security asking you to leave the room. Now for opening statements. First, based on a drawing beforehand, Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 90 seconds. I was born and raised on the White Mountain Apache Nation. My dad ran the general store there. My mother was a public school teacher. Right after high school, I came to Tucson to do my undergraduate work at the University of Arizona. After graduation, I taught school for a while here in Tucson, then went to law school at the University of Arizona. While I was in law school, I actually clerked for the Pima County Attorney's Office. I was a law clerk for Barbara Lawal, who's our current county attorney, and I was also a law clerk for John Roll before he was a judge, and many of you will remember that he was killed uh, in the shooting at the Safeway at Ina in Oracle in January 2011. Uh, I'm honored to be here tonight uh, with my opponent uh, so that we can answer your questions, give our positions, so that you can be an informed voter. And I have to tell you, everywhere I go here in Tucson, whether it be the grocery store or the gas station or just walking in my neighborhood, people come up and express to me their concerns, their fears, their worries in this election. Seniors are afraid they're gonna lose Medicare and Social Security. Women are afraid they're gonna lose their right to choose. And LGBT couples are afraid that once again, they won't be able to, mar to marry. So these are the issues we'll be addressing tonight. And I look forward to our panel's questions. Ms. Kirkpatrick, thank you so much. Ms. Marquez Peterson, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. It's great to see so many friends and supporters here this evening. Um, I've been a small business owner in this community for several decades, and I've been the president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber for the last nine years with offices in Tucson, Sierra Vista, Douglas, and Nogales. I'm a mom. Um, I, my family has lived here for generations, and I've lived here for over 40 years. I've grown up in this community attending TUSD schools, the University of Arizona, and heck, I even remember when Craycroft was a two-lane road. Uh, why am I running for this office? This is my home, and I wanna see political reform. I support term limits. 
Uh, I want to see no budget, no pay, which means if Washington doesn't pass a budget, they shouldn't be paid. And that's probably how your own family and businesses operate also. I also want to tackle waste in government. And people are tired of career politicians, like Ann, who moved from Flagstaff to Phoenix, and then from Phoenix to Tucson to run for this third office in four years. She's even violated her term limit pledge. She is not one of us, and she's moved here to run in our community. Um, I would like to represent our community and be strong and want to ask that I have your support in this CD2 race. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, thank you for your opening comments. Now, on to the questions. The first round will explore partisanship in the politically diverse district. And the first question goes to Ms. Kirkpatrick from Arizona Public Media's Lorraine Rivera. Ms. Kirkpatrick, political divisions play a large role in elections in the district, and independent voters often decide this district. How will you represent such a politically diverse district? Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have one minute. Uh, I grew up in a bipartisan household. My mother's family were Republican ranchers, and my dad's family were Democratic businessmen. Two large families, I always say it made for interesting family get-togethers because everybody had their political opinion. But at the end of the day, we were all family, we were all Arizonans, we were all Americans. And I value that upbringing now more than ever. It's given me the temperament and the experience to go to Congress, to really get to know my colleagues. Legislating is about building relationships, and I am able to do that. That's how you get things done. You find people, find out what their story is, regardless of party, and find that common ground. I did a lot of legislation for veterans. That's really not a partisan issue. And there are many members of all parties who have served our country, are veterans, and really care that veterans get the benefits they've earned. Thank you, Ms. Marquez-Peterson. You have 30 seconds to rebut if you wish. Though I've not been a politician before, this is my first time running for office, I've got a reputation in this community as a problem solver. I've been running one of the largest chambers of commerce in our state, our Tucson Hispanic Chamber, and working with whoever it will take to get the job done, whether they be Democrat, Republican, or Independent. I think many of the issues we're facing are not partisan. I think they're issues that we can talk to others, we can uh, collaborate, we can work closely to get things done, and I'm focused on finding the very best solutions for CD2. Thank you. Our next question is from Steve Goldstein from KJZZ in Phoenix for Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, Arizona's relationship with Mexico is vital. How do you think President Trump has treated the U.S. relationship with Mexico overall? And if you were to win this seat, would you address him directly on some of his anti-Mexico rhetoric? You know, it's interesting. I've even as the chamber president, had the opportunity to address the Trump administration and key advisors on the relationship with Mexico. I've not always agreed with the direction or the comments that he's made, but I've made sure to explain to him the perspective that I have as the Tucson Hispanic Chamber president of how important our relationship with Mexico is. They're, number, they're our number one trading partner for the state of Arizona. More than 110,000 jobs in Arizona depend on trade with Mexico. I have close relationships and have worked uh, with Governor Ducey and the Arizona-Mexico Commission collaboratively with our partners in Mexico. And I would continue to bring that perspective to President Trump and the administration when elected to this office. Thank you. And Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds if you wish. It's so important that we have a good relationship with Mexico. A third of our economy here in southern Arizona comes from Mexico. Uh, I've visited with the mayors uh, of Douglas, Sierra Vista, uh, even Republican business people say they don't want a wall. A wall is not the answer. We need comprehensive immigration reform that protects dreamers and DACA recipients but not a wall. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Joe Ferguson of the Arizona Daily Star, and it is for Ms. Kirkpatrick. Joe? Ms. Kirkpatrick, in 2012, you let Jonathan Payton have it when you were running in CD1, saying he hadn't spent his life in the district like you had. Now you're to talk about your ties to Pima County throughout your life. Why shouldn't voters look at this as you being opportunist? Right after the 2016 election, my daughter, who was in residency here at University Medical Center, gave birth to my second grandson a month early, and he had to be in the newborn ICU. Uh, my daughter and her husband were able to spend time in the hospital, 
but that left me taking care of his 18-month-old brother. And I always said to people, you know, running a competitive Senate race pales in comparison to running after an 18-month-old toddler. So we came down here to help her finish residency, help that family. Uh, I would go over every morning uh, to help her uh, get ready for work and, and get my other grandson off to preschool. Uh, and that's why we were here. I voted for the Affordable Care Act. When Martha McSally voted for that deadly Republican bill that would have kicked millions of people off health care again, I just said, I cannot stand on the sidelines and watch this happen. I'm going to take her on. Of course, she's not running anymore, and I have uh, Ms. Marquez-Peterson as my opponent. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, uh, you have 30 seconds if you would like. So, Jill, it, it is opportunistic. I think she's moved from four hours north if you're in Flagstaff to move to our community to run and attempt to represent us. When in her past race with Jonathan Payton, you're right. She said someone had to have a lifetime of service in the community in order to truly represent. Well, I have that lifetime of service. Having lived here more than 40 years, running the Tucson Hispanic Chamber, raising my family here, being a small business owner here, um, and I think it makes a difference that we have someone who's running with the community at heart, and I'm running to represent my home in Congress. Thank you. Our next question is from Ron Hansen from the Arizona Republic. We are halfway through this segment, and this question goes to Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, uh, you've largely ignored media requests for interviews in the weeks leading up to Election Day, uh, while as the serving the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you made yourself available regularly. Why the sudden change? I wouldn't state that it's a change. I think what I've done is be very strategic about outreach and beyond Tucson, focus on talking to voters in Sierra Vista and Douglas and Wilcox, Green Valley, Saborita. I mean, this district is very broad and I've made myself very available to voters who wanna talk about particular issues. Um, the important issues I've been talking to them about have been jobs in the economy, support for our military, healthcare, uh, border security, um, and really, hearing their perspective so that I could truly represent them when I'm elected to Congress. Thank you, and Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds if you would like it. My opponent has not been accessible to the people in CD2. Uh, during the primary, her forums were closed door events. They even uh, wouldn't let Joe Ferguson in to report on it. She hasn't met with the media. Uh, she's running a very closed door type of campaign, uh, just like Martha McSally, and this is one of the problems why Martha McSally was so vulnerable in this district because people wanted to see her. They wanted to have town halls. My opponents actually said she's not going to do any town halls. Thank you. We are now on to our next question. It will be for Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Arizona Public Media's Lorraine Rivera. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you voted for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House in each of your three prior congressional terms, and she helped bankroll your campaign this cycle. Many Democrats are urging for a change in the party's leadership. Will you support Nancy Pelosi for Speaker of the House in 2019? You have one. I, I've publicly said that if Nancy wants to be in leadership, I will support her. And here's why. Uh, I'm the only candidate up here who's been in the majority. And I will tell you that uh, if Democrats are successful in taking back the House and we're in the majority, we're going to be taking on really hefty legislation. That's what we did last time we were in the majority. And it was a large caucus. We had the progressives, we had the blue dogs, uh, we had the Hispanic caucus, the African-American caucus, women's caucus, and we debated vigorously in our caucus room. But Nancy Pelosi was able to bring us to a consensus on legislation that we could actually pass. She never took a bill to the floor when she didn't have the votes to pass it, and no modern speaker before or since has been able to do that, especially Paul Ryan, the current speaker. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you have 30 seconds if you'd like. Yeah, I believe Ann Kirkpatrick will vote for Nancy Pelosi. She's voted with her over 90% of the time as she served in Congress before. Um, I think that if Ann is elected to the seat, we will see tax reform roll back. We'll see the economy, all the great progress we've seen, that will roll back. It'll be a detrimental effect on Southern Arizona. Thank you. Our next question is from Steve Goldstein for Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, as with most congressional campaigns, there's been a lot of outside money, a lot of outside involvement. 
Have you agreed with all the actions and advertisements in your behalf from outside supporters? Absolutely not. I mean, I've not run for office before, and I've got to tell you how surprising it is to see the nastiness and the lies that can be put on in mailers. And if I could use one as an example, um, this mailer was sent out by Ann and Nancy Pelosi then said that I took more than $50,000 in special interest group money, when in fact Ann had taken more than $3 million in special interest group money over her career as a politician. Just the hypocrisy and, and the craziness that goes into political advertising. Um, additional uh, lies that have been told is that I would eliminate Social Security and Medicare. That is absolutely not something that I stand for. And I, I assure everybody that I would make sure that people receive what they've promised and what they've paid into. Thank you. And Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds. I'm running a positive campaign. Now, there are outside groups that may come in and run negative pieces against my opponent, but that's not me. If it doesn't say I approved it or I paid for it, it's not my ad. <clears throat> it's actually illegal for me to have anything to do with those outside ads that come in. Uh, so I just want the viewers to know that unless it has my name on it, it's not my ad, we're running only a positive campaign. Thank you. It's now <clears throat> time for follow-ups. Uh, Joe Ferguson from the Arizona Daily Star, you have a follow-up. Please indicate which candidate you are directing the question to first, and both candidates will be given an opportunity to answer all follow-up questions, and you'll have 45 seconds for these answers. Joe? This question is for Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Would you like Donald Trump to join you on the campaign trail here in CD2? I think having any president in a district would be quite an honor. I have not requested his uh, attendance in southern Arizona, and I'm running on my own regard. I think it's a matter of making sure that people understand my experience as a problem solver, taking initiative, being involved in my community. Um, I chair the board of St. Mary's Hospital. I'm involved in Visit Tucson. I'm serving a capacity in di uh, many different community boards because I truly care and love this community. So I'm going to run on my own regard and really be an independent voice uh, in this district. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 45 seconds. My, my opponent, excuse me, <clears throat> my opponent brought uh, Speaker Ryan to Tucson. She will follow his agenda to a T. She's not independent. Uh, he has his agenda of privatizing Social Security. She has said she would privatize Social Security, get rid of Medicare. Uh, she does not support a woman's, woman's right to choose. Uh, those are the things that will happen if the Republicans stay in power. They will privatize Social Security, they will cut Medicare benefits, and they will get rid of a woman's right to choose. Those are the issues that are at stake, and my opponent is not being truthful and forthright about where she stands. Thank you. Uh, we are about to change subjects, and I want to thank both candidates at this point for keeping to the times and also for the audience for being respectful. We now turn our attention to issues related to our most precious resource, water. The first question is from Ron Hansen for Ms. Kirkpatrick. Ms. Kirkpatrick, what should be the federal government's role or Congress's role in a drought contingency plan that serves multiple states in the Colorado River watershed? We have a water caucus and it's primarily Western states. It has to be a regional solution because we're all in this together. We've got to find solutions for the West. Uh, but we also have a serious problem right here in Congressional District 2. I was down in Sulphur Springs Valley, I uh, you know, recently heard a story of a family there, bought land with a home there. They were from the Midwest, they didn't even think to ask about water. They got there, turned on the spigot, and out came sand and mud. Uh, and that's because the water table there has been sucked out by these large, large foreign agriculture farms. We've got to address that problem. We've got to have hearings in Congress about that. It affects so many people in the West. There is a solution. We can come out with a, a drought plan uh, that affects all of the Western states and addresses the lack of water in the Colorado River. Those are tough questions that we need to deal with, and, and we can do it. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you have 30 seconds if you'd like. So the role of the federal government, I think, is certainly in planning. However, some of the 
the very drastic conditions we're facing in Cochise County in particular, need to be a partnership between local jurisdictions and the federal government. One of the first things we can do is appoint a director of Bureau and Land Management. That's an important function, an important person that can relate to the, the water situation and the crisis we're facing in Cochise County. I think decisions about water need to be made locally by local jurisdictions, and they need to be at the table. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lorraine Rivera, and it is for Ms. Marquez-Peterson. How will you work to get Congress to prioritize what are often seen as Western issues like federal versus private land use and water conservation policy? I think it's truly about having a seat at the table, engaging in committees that react to, to those issues. Um, I, in particular, are interested in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I think that's my background and that suits very well. Um, I think that being able to provide perspective and an independent voice in Congress on some of these very important issues is key, and that's how we'll get things done. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds. I was on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and plan to be on that committee again, working in southern Arizona to improve infrastructure and get funding for projects, working with Mayor Rothschild, with the local mayors, and CD2 uh, to improve that critical infrastructure, which we need to do to improve our economy. It's so important that we have good roads, that we have a working water system, that we have good paying 21st century jobs and a quality education for our children. Those are all infrastructure projects. Our next question is to Ms. Marquez-Peterson and it comes from Steve Goldstein. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, coming back to something Ms. Kirkpatrick had said, while farmers who can afford to dig wells will continue to dig deeper. A little bit of an offshoot of what she had to say about people from the Midwest, out of state, stepping in there. You know, I've talked to folks throughout Cochise County, including the Fort Huachuca, the development, uh, uh, land development companies. Um, so many folks have different opinions there. And I'm truly going to stand by the fact that we need local jurisdictions and those organizations at the table. It needs to be a local solution. Certainly, federal government can provide support in the planning. But I think we need to rely on folks within Cochise County to solve this problem and not step in as the federal government to try and solve that for them. Thank you. And Ms. Kirkpatrick, my mistake, that question was actually supposed to go to you. So we'll give you a full minute to answer instead <laughs> That's of 30 great. seconds. That's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, water is so critical, uh, and I know that uh, Senator Kyle and Senator McCain were working closely with me to come up with a strategy for Arizona. One of the things we really need to do is have a statewide drought plan. We are in a drought, uh, but we need to be all working together off of the same blueprint to preserve our water. That includes things like low uh, uh, or more efficient uh, water tanks, water sinks, uh, using gray water where we can, uh, conservation measures, perhaps collecting rainwater to uh, garden with. Uh, there's so many things that we can do that really we aren't doing. And it takes leadership. It takes leadership like Senator McCain was providing to do that. And I plan to provide that leadership in Arizona and throughout the West, not only in Congressional District 2. Thank you. And our next question will be to you, Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Joe Ferguson. Ms. Kirkpatrick, should Congress step into local water decisions, such as the approval of a subdivision in Sierra Vista with several thousand homes, if it threatens the federal properties like Fort Huachuca? Yeah, you know, I used to serve on the Water Commission, and one of the real concerns I had was approval of these subdivisions without actually looking at a water source for those subdivisions. That would have really saved this family a lot of problems. It has to be a joint effort between the federal government and the state government working together to make sure that we've got checks and balances in place so people aren't sold land or houses that don't have adequate water. I really feel for that family. They invested their entire life savings into that property, and now they can't sell it because they don't have water source, a water source. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you have 30 seconds if you'd like it. You know, in the Sierra Vista community, this has been so top of mind, Joe, as you're aware. Um, they'd not pulled a housing permit in a long time. So I think having that discussion, having that the local and the state weigh in on the determination if that subdivision can be approved is key. I think, again, the federal government can provide guidelines, but those decisions should be made at the local and the state level. Thank you. 
We have a follow-up question uh, from Ron Hansen with the Arizona Republic. Uh, let us know who you'd like to ask. Yeah, uh, Lee Marquez uh, Peterson. Uh, do you accept the science of climate change? And if so, what are you willing to do to act on that, in, that uh, body of knowledge from uh, climate scientists? I think uh, it's a delicate balance between uh, growing a company and the environmental regulations that are put in place and not having them overreach. Uh, but I think it is a very delicate balance that must be met. Thank you. And Ms. Kirkpatrick? You have uh, 45 seconds for this follow-up. Let's go ahead and hear from the candidates. <laughs> uh, I believe the science behind climate change. Uh, the Defense Department believes it. It's been said it's the biggest existential threat to the planet. We should have done something about it 20 years ago. But we really have to do something now. We have to lower fossil fuel emissions and Tucson's a great place for this because we should be using alternative energy. We should be the solar capital of the world right here in Tucson. Gabby Giffords was working on that. I want to pick up that effort because we can do it. Let's stop using fossil fuel. Let's convert to alternative energy, wind, solar, natural gas where it makes sense. Thank you. We're almost halfway through the evening, hard as that is to believe, and we are changing topics. We now turn our attentions to questions related to border security and immigration. We begin with a question from Lorraine Rivera for Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, should DACA recipients, so-called dreamers, be granted citizenship? And if so, what do you say to the thousands of immigrants who are currently waiting for their citizenship request to be processed? I support DREAMers uh, achieving legal status. Um, I do not believe it should include a pathway to citizenship and that we need to focus on immigration reform. To me, immigration reform means something that's merit-based, that includes a family, and uh, also includes border security. I do support a wall where it makes sense, surveillance technology resources, increased border patrol. I think all of that should be done together. It is a very complex issue, uh, but I do support legal status for DREAMers. Ms. Kirkpatrick? I support DACA recipients. I support DREAMers. I had an immigration working group to address immigration reform. And I always started my meetings with testimonies from DREAMers, DACA recipients, three or four of them, different ones each time. Their stories are so emotional, so impactful, and in so many cases tragic, that I thought, you know, if it, Capitol Hill could hear these stories, we'd get immigration reform done. So I introduced legislation to allow DREAMers to work on Capitol Hill, and I want to do that again. Thank you. Steve Goldstein, a question for Ms. Kirkpatrick. Ms. Kirkpatrick, the Latino community we know is not monolithic, but as a group, they tend to specifically oppose President Trump's plan for a border wall. How specific would you be as far as those in the Latino community who see bigotry in the White House? How would you try to address that? Well, let me talk about border security. Uh, the border's only secure when the people who live there feel that it's secure. And I know ranchers along that. The border who feel that the president's policies are, are inflaming the issue. And you know, the policy of separating children from their parents is, is a horrible, horrible, gut-wrenching, painful policy. A black eye on our country for the rest of our history. I have three grandchildren under the age of three. And the fact that they would ever be separated against their will from their parents and put in the hands of a stranger, I can't, I can't bear to even think about that. I don't know how these families are coping with it. We've got to stop that policy. We've got to pass border policies that are humane and legal. What this administration is doing is inhumane and illegal. Thank you, Ms. Marquez-Peterson. You know, I've spent time with Sheriff Daniels of Cochise County, as well as ranchers in Naco along the border, and I've actually learned, I think Ann has not met with Sheriff Daniels yet, but the sheriff and others talk about the fact that drug smuggling and human trafficking is real and it's occurring at our southern border. Uh, we need to protect uh, our families that are along the border. I think ranchers should tell you they have fear related to uh, people that might be coming through the desert with guns and other uh, terrorism 
um, issues. So I think it's important that we do secure the border. For me, that is a wall where it makes sense. Again, it's surveillance resources, uh, it's increased border patrol, and it's also resources for our sheriff's offices, who in many cases are, are choosing to uh, Ms. help Marquez and assist. Ms. Peterson, you're over time. Sorry. Thank you. Our next question is from Joe Ferguson, and it is a question for Ms. Marquez Peterson. Uh, President Trump says NAFTA is one of the worst business agreements in modern history. You, as a CEO and a Republican, worked closely with business organizations in Mexico. Do you think the newly announced USMACA agreement is an improvement over NAFTA? So I was a big proponent of NAFTA being improved and updated. It was 24 years old. We didn't have internet when it was originally written um, and expressed concern to the Trump administration while he was renegotiating this. We did not want to see NAFTA go away, specifically because of the 110,000 jobs I mentioned previously and the billions of dollars of trade between Southern Arizona and Mexico. Um, I do support the US-Mexico-Canada agreement that was recently put in place. I think we've been able to see President Trump, regardless of the relationship with Mexico, which had gotten rocky, negotiate a win-win for uh, the United States and Mexico, and that includes Canada. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for our businesses and for those that do trade. In Southern Arizona, in CD2, we are very dependent on our relationship with Mexico. So I applaud the effort to get the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement in place. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds. We have to look at all of our trade agreements and, and re-examine them. Uh, are they fair? Every trade agreement has a winner and a loser. Uh, and it has to be a transparent process, public process, so people can know what's in the trade agreement. Um, how many people know what Trump plans to do with NAFTA? Uh, I haven't heard anything. That's the problem with this administration. And my opponent is going to be lockstep with the administration to address problems in a non-open, uh, transparent manner. Thank you. Our next question is for Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Ron Hansen. Ms. Kirkpatrick, um, explain your view on how sheriff's departments and in border counties should support or work with federal immigration and law enforcement officers. When I uh, was serving on the Homeland Security Committee, I went to the border, met with the Border Patrol, local law enforcement, uh, and at that particular time, the Border Patrol didn't believe they had the resources they needed to do the job. Uh, look, I'm a former prosecutor. I have zero tolerance for the criminal activity at the board. So I at the border. So I introduced legislation in 2010 that would give an extra 700 uh, million dollars to the border patrol. This allowed them to hire more agents, uh, use drones, and lock up more criminals. Uh, things are operating better, but it's really important that we have that dialogue with the people who are actually in the field trying to make these areas safe. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson. In CD2, I think that Sheriff Napier and Sheriff Daniels have done an incredible job of providing additional resources for border security. Um, I support that that continues. I would have supported and accepted Stone Garden funding if Pima County had uh, not put that away. I think that is something that now Sheriff Napier has to come out of his own budget to cover, which I think is a shame. We need all the resources we can get at the border, and I think it's vitally important. Thank you. We are now uh, finished with that segment, but we have a quick follow-up from Lorraine Rivera. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, we'll begin with you on this one. Um, we've already discussed the family separation policy. What other border issue is nuanced that Washington needs to better understand, given that we are here in southern Arizona directly on the border? And you will both have 45 seconds to answer this. Okay. Um, I think investment in our ports of entry is vitally important. In CD2, we have the Raul H. Castro port of entry in Douglas. We need investment in that port. More than a billion dollars is spent a year on trade between Pima County and Mexico. There's so much more we could be doing throughout southern Arizona and the state of Arizona with additional port of entry funding. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick. You know, we need, we need to pass very common sense legislation. I'll just give you an example. In 2012, the farmers came to me. Agriculture is a big, big economy in Arizona. And they said, we've got an immigration bill that we think Congress can pass. Basically, if someone can show that they have a job, that they're working, they're, they have legal status, and then they have a couple of years to choose 
whether they want to be a, in a guest worker program or they want to pursue citizenship. Very simple plan. I really thought we could get that done. And here we are, again, with the Republicans in control, and they haven't addressed immigration reform. John McCain got it through the Senate in 2013, but it couldn't get through the Republican House. Thank you. For the remainder of the evening, we'll ask questions covering a variety of issues facing the nation. We begin with Steve Goldstein from KJZZ, and this question is for Ms. Kirkpatrick. Ms. Kirkpatrick, there's another BRAC-based realignment and closure coming in 2021. If you're serving in Congress during that discussion, what specifically would you try to do as a member of Congress to ensure that Fort Huachuca remains a viable asset for the U.S. military and in Cochise County? Yes, you know, we have Fort Huachuca, which is a cyber command center, and then we've got Davis Month and Air Force Base, which is home for the A-10. I co-sponsored Ron Le uh, Barber's legislation to save the A-10. Those two bases combined bring about $5 billion to Southern Arizona. Uh, I would fight any effort to close down either one of those bases and would work with the commanders at both bases to make sure they have the resources that they need. I want to be on the Appropriation Committee. We don't have anyone in, in Arizona on the Appropriation Committee right now, and I'd like to be on the Defense Subcommittee to make sure that we protect Fort Huachuca and all, also Davis Month, and, uh, and we'll work very hard to do that. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you have 30 seconds if you would like. So I've been working on this issue. I've been part of the Southern Arizona Defense Alliance, which are community leaders that have gathered to fight against BRAC in Southern Arizona. I'm also a member of DM50, which is the community support group here in our community. You need community outreach and support and an outpouring of that support in order to fight back uh, on BRAC. We need additional missions. We need to do all we can to support and protect Fort Huachuca and Davis Monthan. Thank you. Our next question is for Ms. Marquez Peterson, and it comes from Joe Ferguson. Ms. Marquez Peterson, we all know the history of the A 10. What will you do specifically to protect DM after the A 10 is no longer flying? Good question. We need to continue to fight for any additional resources for the A 10 while we can. And I know Congresswoman McSally has done a great job at that, but you're right. We need to continue to look for additional missions at Davis Monthan Air Force Base. And that's something that I would continue to do to step into her shoes and continue the work that she's done. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds if you'd like. I've talked with pilots who've flown the A-10 and they tell me it's one of the best planes they've ever flown, that it's much more agile in the air than for instance, the F-35. So I also believe that we should keep the A-10 in the fleet. It's a big part of what Davis Monthan does. I want to keep that A-10 at Davis Monthan, keep the base open, uh, and we'll continue the fight that Gabby Giffords and Ron Barber started over keeping that a healthy military base. Thank you. The next question comes to you, Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Ron Hansen. Uh, Ms. Kirkpatrick, we've heard conflicting answers from you recently regarding President Trump and impeachment. To be clear, do you think President Trump has committed impeachable offenses, and would you support pursuing articles of impeachment against him at this point? You know, as a prosecutor, I never interfered with the law enforcement investigation. I let them complete their work, bring their report to me, and then I would look it over and make a, a judgment as to whether or not I would issue a charge. Congress needs to do that same thing regarding impeachment. There, ne there needs to be a hearing. We need to let uh, uh, Mr. Mueller do his investigation with no interference from the administration, uh, see a report at the end of the day, look at it, have hearings, make sure the public knows what's in that report, and then make that decision. It has to be a thoughtful, studious, very careful process. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson. I agree we need an investigation. And it's one of the reasons I was shocked when Anne, as a former prosecutor, was caught on tape saying she would absolutely impeach President Trump uh, without any kind of judgment. Uh, I think if you want to hear the audio for yourself, you can go to annekirkpatrick.org and listen to that audio and hear her say that without any kind of investigation, she would impeach the president. Thank you. Our next question is for Ms. Marquez-Peterson, and it comes from Lorraine Rivera. Last year's tax cut package is expected to add more than $1 trillion to the national debt. 
Republicans have looked to cut future debt by scaling back spending on programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Do you support cutbacks on those programs, or are you willing to accept the higher debt? Um, I do not support cuts in Social Security and Medicare. Um, I believe we've made promises to folks who've paid into the system, and they need to be honored. Um, in terms of the national debt, I think we need a robust economy to build ourselves out of that, and the Tax and Jobs Act has been very beneficial. It's led our economic prosperity that we are seeing in our region. The average family in CD2 will receive more than $2,000 a year. Um, gosh, consumer confidence, small business confidence is at the highest levels it's been in decades. I think it's been very positive and we need to let the robust economy tackle some of the debt issues that we're gonna be, be facing. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have 30 seconds if you'd like. My opponent supports the massive tax cuts for the wealthy and big corporations. And Paul Ryan came to Tucson for her and he said, how are we gonna pay for it? We're gonna to have to look at Social Security and Medicare. Believe me, under his leadership, she will cut Social Security and Medicare. I'm endorsed by the Committee to Protect and Preserve Social Security and Medicare. And that is because I fight to keep those programs. They are not entitlements, they are earned benefits, and our seniors deserve to have them. Thank you. Our next question is from Steve Goldstein, and it is for Ms. Kirkpatrick. Ms. Kirkpatrick, I want to return to the topic of immigration reform. Arizona's had many leaders when it comes to that. The phrase comprehensive immigration reform used to get tossed around a lot, not quite as much now. And I'm wondering, going forward, do you think it is a possibility to have a humane policy, but that also includes border security? Is this Congress ready to do that if you're in the House? Do you have one? I, I really believe it's possible to do that. Uh, and you know, if we pass comprehensive immigration reform, we free, free up the Border Patrol to focus on the criminal activity, stop the cartels, stop the human trafficking, stop the drug trafficking. But families who want to come here either to work or to make a, li a better life for their families should have a legal way to do that. Uh, it's, a, it's a top priority. When John McCain uh, ushered through that legislation in 2013, I thought we'd have it done by now. I really did. Uh, but we're going to push for it until we get it done. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, and I spoke about immigration reform previously. I do believe we need to tackle this now, and regardless of party, people know that the system is broken. Uh, we need an immigration reform that includes something that's merit-based, uh, that includes family, um, and that includes border security, which, as I've mentioned, for me includes a wall where it makes sense, surveillance, increased border patrol, uh, resources for our sheriffs. I think it is something we need to tackle again now. Chris, if I may, yes. one quick follow-up. But do you think it can get done? I understand what your views are, but do you think this Congress is ready to make that happen? I've also been here and seen generations of bills worked on by Senator McCain or Senator Flake in the past, and I do think there's a will to get this done. Ms. Kirkpatrick, would you like 45 seconds on that follow-up? Yes, I would. Uh, one of the things I like to do is put together working groups on various issues. I talked a little bit earlier about my immigration working group, I wanna do that again. Uh, and so it's a, a way to engage the community to give me good ideas on legislation that we can pass. I really believe the people who are in the trenches know best. So this is very much uh, an approach that from the bottom up rather than me imposing my ideas on the constituents here in Congressional District 2. And I look forward to setting up the immigration re working group, but we'll have other working groups on the serious problems that we're facing. Thank you. We now turn to Joe Ferguson with a question for Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, can you cite any significant areas where you differ from Martha McSally? If possible, can you name some specifics? From Martha McSally, um, I have been a, uh, an advocate for tariffs and ha their impact on our small business community. I'm not particularly clear on what her role is in that or what her position, but I'll tell you it's an area in which I've expressed concern to the Trump administration. Um, we have uh, small businesses within our Chamber of Commerce that have been dramatically impacted by the steel and aluminum tariffs, even when there was a threat of them before they were in place. And I made sure to give that perspective and have a seat at the table with the Trump administration to explain just those dire effects on our businesses as he went through his negotiation. Uh, so those are areas in which I have differed with the Trump administration in particular. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick. I see three areas where my opponent 
uh, and Martha McSally agree. They both want to privatize Social Security. Uh, they do not support a woman's right to choose, and they don't believe in being accessible to the public. Uh, you know, there's a movement that started. You know, McSally, stay, take a stand. Where is she? We can't see her. We, she doesn't speak to us. She doesn't do town halls. My opponent has said the very same thing. Uh, she has not made herself open and accessible to the community, and she'll continue to do that. Thank you. Our next question is for Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Ron Hansen. Ms. Kirkpatrick, in three terms in Washington, you were the principal sponsor of three bills that became law. Um, one took care of two property owners who had a bad land survey in 1960. Another involved renaming a post office in Miami, Arizona. And the third involved a financial break for Native American veterans seeking housing assistance. What can the residents and constituents of CD2 expect you to accomplish in your next term if you get one? Yes, you know, they, what they can expect is somebody who will listen to the problem and figure out a way to solve it. I passed that legislation with an Arizona Republican congressman. Uh, we decided, who had run against me and beat me, actually, in 2010, and we decided to put our differ differences aside for the good of Arizona and work together. And I look forward to working with Arizona's congressional delegation, Democrats and Republicans, to get legislation that's significant to Southern Arizona passed in a bipartisan way. And so we'll be listening to, to folks who uh, say, you know, we need this legislation to address border security, we need this legislation to address education. I already hear that a lot. Oh, we need, we need to protect Social Security and Medicare and put them on a sustainable path. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Well, since I've never run for office, I'm not a politician, I've not had the opportunity to vote, I think we need a, a lot of action related to our veterans. We have more than 60,000 veterans that live in this district. We need to focus on bills that are going to impact the quality of the service, the timeliness uh, of the services that they're provided. Um, constituent services, I think, are key to any congressperson. And I plan and commit to our veterans that I will do all I can to ensure that we have quality constituent services for them throughout the district. We have about 10 minutes left of question. And actually, uh, for both of you, I have a question. Uh, and Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you'll get to answer this first, but I'll give you both one minute to answer. This district is split nearly evenly, a third, a third, a third, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. If you are elected, knowing how your district is split, what is one issue you would reach across the aisle to the other side to pass? And Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you may go first and you have a minute. So as I mentioned, I've been running our Tucson Hispanic Chamber, which is nonpartisan, but includes people from the entire region, all different parties and so on. An issue of, of top importance to them is health care. And the current Affordable Care Act has not been affordable. It's something that most of our small businesses cannot provide or, or afford to provide insurance. And they are, we're now down to one insurance company in the state servicing us. I think we need a bipartisan solution for the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I think we need to figure out something that's going to work, looking for ideas, uh, insurance across state lines, association plans. We need to sit together, uh, nonpartisan nature, and, and figure this out because we cannot do without quality health insurance. Thank you. And Ms. Kirkpatrick, we'll give you a minute for this. Health insurance is very important to families here in Arizona and across the country. Uh, and repealing Obama Obamacare is not the answer. But you know, in Arizona, we have many places where we only have one insurance carrier in the marketplace. My idea is let people buy in to Medicare. Medicare is a system that people like, it works, and this is also paid for because there would be a premium, like an insurance premium, paid for the coverage. Uh, but it would give people a choice where they only have one other insurance company to look to. But I also want to talk about ed education. We haven't talked much about education, how important it is in Arizona. I'm a product of Arizona's public schools. There are three federal programs that the funding needs to be restored. Head Start, Secure Rural Schools, and Payment in Lieu of Taxes. Arizona's unique in that over 80% of our land is public land. We fund education on property tax. Payment in Lieu of Taxes is meant to make up for the, that lack of private property when we have so much federal and state public land. 
Thank you. Our next question is to you, Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Lorraine Rivera. Um, Ms. Kirkpatrick, what improvements, and you mentioned this just a moment ago about healthcare, but could you name two specific improvements to drastically change the healthcare system? Yes. Uh, we need to require Medicare to negotiate prescription drug costs. Uh, you know, I hear from that from people more than any other issue that their prescription drug costs are keeping keep going up. So that's something we can do. Uh, I think we also need to address the opioid crisis. And we need to make sure that pharmacists are part of the care team for a person who's being treated for pain. Uh, and in order to do that, they have to be able to be reimbursed by Medicare to work on that process and be a part of the care team. Care team. So those are two changes that come to mind right away that we could get done. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Um, if you've heard Ann on the campaign trail, she says that her vote on the Affordable Care Act is her proudest vote, her proudest moment, which to me is completely out of touch with CD2. Um, it is not affordable. We were promised choices we don't have. Uh, the doctors we wanted to keep, we can't use. I think we need more choices. We need more insurance companies. This needs to be something that makes sense for both the companies and the patients and so on so that we can truly get the coverage we need. For me, changes would be uh, coverage across state lines, association plans, and other uh, innovative ways that we can provide more options to people. Thank you. Our next question is for Ms. Marquez-Peterson, and it comes from Steve Goldstein. Ms. Marquez-Peterson, Arizona has a history of Republican members of Congress who, whether they call it pork or something else, are less inclined to want to bring projects back to Arizona. I want to know, based on how you think about the deficit and whatnot, are there certain things that you would advocate, or specifically, would you be okay with competing with other states for certain projects, or would you view them as pork? I think we need to do all we can representing the state to bring our fair share back to Arizona, whether that's transportation dollars or that's career and technical education dollars. Whatever that entails, we need to ensure that we get our fair share back. Thank you. And Ms. Kirkpatrick. In my first term, we had earmarks. It was a very transparent process. Uh, we collected projects in Arizona. We listed them on our website. We took public input uh, and then made decisions on which ones the public thought most should be funded. Uh, you know, we have small towns in this district that need sewer, uh, wastewater treatment plants, uh, the water issue, infrastructure. They can't fund it locally without those federal dollars. Thank you. Our next question is for you, Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from Joe Ferguson. Ms. Kirkpatrick, can you talk to us a little bit about your record with the NRA? You once had an A rating, and now you say that you are backed by Gabby Giffords and by pro-gun reform groups. So can you explain what changed? I grew up in rural Arizona. I used to hunt with my dad. Uh, it was part of our way of life. Uh, but Gabby Giffords was a mentor me to me in the legislature and also in Congress. And I was a law clerk for John Roll. In fact, he had just come back and visited with me right before the shooting. So I was devastated when Gabby was shot uh, when Gabe Zimmerman was killed, John, John Roll was killed, uh, and I have changed my votes, my, the way I ad, uh, address gun violence. I am part of a program, Moms Demand Action, and I know there are moms here tonight. Thank you, moms, for being here. Uh, I'm particularly interested in a program that teaches parents, before they schedule a play date, call the other family and say, do you own guns? Do you have them in your house? Are they loaded? Where do you keep them? And if the parents are not comfortable with any of those answers, they don't schedule the play date. We've got to do common sense, sensible things to stop gun violence. Thank you. Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Um, I am pro-Second Amendment. I do not believe we should be penalizing illegal gun owners, lawful gun owners, and taking guns away. I think we need to focus on the issue, which is keeping guns out of the hands of bad people, those that would hurt themselves and hurt others. We have a lot of work to do in terms of databases that do not speak one to another, mental health, uh, behavioral health, criminal activity, databases that I think need additional resources. And I think we need additional education around that. But I am pro-Second Amendment. This is our final question, how quickly an hour goes. It goes to Ms. Kirkpatrick, and it comes from you, Lorraine Rivera. The population base of CD2 is in the metro Tucson area, but of course the largest land mass of the district is in Cochise County, a more rural area. 
How do you balance the district needs between these two communities? Yeah, I, you know, I listen to people. Uh, my ranching background resonates with uh, people in Cochise County, uh, but my previous district had the northern suburbs of Tucson and also had Greenlee County. So I start with a base of being known in Cochise County and also in Tucson. Uh, we had Oral Valley and Marana had an office in Oral Valley of uh, volunteers coming in, working uh, to get me elected. And, and so we, I start as a known quantity uh, and, and, um, and we're building on that. Uh, I've got six offices open. We've got hundreds of volunteers going out, talking with voters about what's important to them. I knock on doors myself. Um, I like to continue to have those conversations. But I, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, people come up to me now and express their worries, their concerns, their anxieties about what's happening to this country and how important this election is to our values and principles. Ms. Marquez-Peterson. Um, this is not a new issue to me. As I mentioned, I've lived here more than 40 years. My chamber operates already in Cochise County and throughout Pima County. Arizona's economy is on fire. We're doing great things. Maricopa County is growing dramatically. We've not seen that same lift in Pima County, and it's even more affected in Cochise County. And I'm aware of that. More than 94% of our businesses in Southern Arizona are small business, so less than 25 employees. That's the type of, of community I've been working with and very familiar with some of the challenges that face rural Arizona Peterson. and Pima County. I'm going to cut you off so we can go to closing okay. statements. We are to closing statements. You will each have one minute. And Ms. Marquez-Peterson, you have the first minute. Certainly. Well, it's clear that people are tired of politics as usual, tired of the nastiness, um, Washington and politics. I showed you the flyer earlier that was a clear example of that, of where I've had lies put out against me and other candidates uh, related to $50,000 in special interest money when Ann has taken more than $3 million in money from special interest groups. I'm running for office to represent our community, and she's running for this office simply to get back to D.C. I mentioned that Anne, this is her third race in four years, and that she has violated even her own term limit pledge. I think it's time we have someone who's representing us clearly in the community. Um, I would be honored to serve my home as your congresswoman. Thank you so much. And Ms. Kirkpatrick, you have one minute for a closing I want statement. to correct a, a couple of things that my opponent doesn't understand. Uh, first of all, she talked about people having separate accounts for Social Security. That's not the way it works. It's not an IRA. You don't pay into Social Security, and it goes into your own account. Uh, and it just shows how unprepared she is for this job. She wants to put Social Security in the hands of Wall Street. We saw what happened when the greedy Wall Street bankers looked out for themselves, not the American people, and we had the Great Recession. Just imagine how bad it would have been if seniors had their Social Security managed by Wall Street. She does not support a right to choose, and she supports Paul Ryan, who came here for a fundraiser. My opposition has spent over $40 million attacking me, mainly on my health care vote, which I am proud of and it was the right thing to do. I voted for the Affordable Care Act in spite of being told that I would lose my next election, and I did, but it was the right thing to do. Thank you both. We have uh, reached the end of the Your Vote 2018 Congressional District 2 debate, presented live from here at the Tucson Jewish Community Center. Thank you so much to the Jays staff for hosting us this evening, and thanks to our panel of journalists, including Lorraine Rivera, from Arizona Public Media, and all of our partners in tonight's debate, Steve Goldstein from our NPR sister station in Phoenix, KJZZ, Joe Ferguson of the Arizona Daily Star, and Ron Hansen of the Arizona Republic. And to the candidates, Ms. Kirkpatrick and Ms. Marquez-Peterson, thank you to both of you for observing time. Thank you for answering our questions. Thank you for taking the time to run for office. And also to our viewers and listeners, Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're in Arizona, remember, early ballots go out tomorrow. So it's time to remember what they said and begin voting. For those of you who don't get early ballots, Election Day is November 6th. I'm Christopher Conover. Have a good night. <laughs>